Hey, Matt Tuckman here from Elucidations. Guess what? We're going to do a listener Q&A episode. Do you have a philosophical problem you've been stuck on? If so, you can send us a voice memo, and Agnes Callard, Ben Callard, and I will do our best to try to resolve it. We'd like you to keep your question to under one minute in length so that we have time to get around to a couple of them. And we'd like you to record it on your phone. So if you have an iPhone, please use Apple Voice Memo. And if you have an Android phone, we recommend the app called ASR. Then once you've recorded your question, you can email it to us at elucidations at uchicago.edu. If, as the day goes by, you forget everything I just said, no problem. You can go to our blog at elucidations.now.sh to read these exact instructions. We're looking forward to your questions, and without any further ado, let's move on to the episode. Thanks, Matt. Hello, I'm Yuejin Li with the Elucidations podcast. Work is an essential part of human life. For example, we are largely defined by the job that we each do for a living. However, work in modern life isn't always fulfilling. Instead, we often feel that work is exhausting, as it takes it out of us. For our guest, Fritjof Bergman, this isn't a necessary feature of work. Instead, work is supposed to be fulfilling, engaging, vitalizing, and life-strengthening. This gap between what work has been and what work can be points to a need for a new kind of work. To hear more, please join us for a discussion with Fritjof Bergman and David Hembold on New Work, New Culture. Hello and welcome to Elucidations, an unexpected philosophy podcast. I'm Matt Teichman. Yuejin Li. With us today is Fritjof Bergman, Professor Emeritus of Philosophy at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and Director of the Center for New Work, and David Helmbold, a retired public servant and close collaborator of Fritjof Bergman's. Fritjof Bergman's new book, New Work, New Culture is out now from Zero Books, which is an imprint of John Hunt Press, and the Center for New Work is located in many different countries around the world. They are here to discuss New Work, New Culture. Fritjof Bergman and David Helmbold, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us on this program. So one thing I think is really interesting about the topic of work is that when you talk to people about it in everyday conversations, you kind of get two conflicting stories. Sometimes when you talk to people about work, they say, oh, work is such a slog. I hate it. Oh, Mondays, am I right? It's you know such a drag. I wish I didn't have to go into work every day. But other times when you talk to people about work, they sort of praise it as something honorable and venerable. Like it's really important to do work and to work hard. That's part of what it is to live a great life. What are we to make of the fact that there are these sort of like two inconsistent pictures of whether work is good or bad? I can make something of that fact in, by mentioning right at the beginning of our conversation that uh, I started to focus on the subject of work many years ago, and everybody told me that I was making a great mistake that I had had a very excellent career in philosophy at Princeton and Stanford and other places, and that work was a waste of my time, that there was nothing interesting to be said about work. And I disagreed with that from the beginning and said that far from that, work would soon become a very interesting subject. And of course that, among all the other things, this is one thing that I was not wrong about, that it has become much more of a subject than it was 10 or 20 years ago. Not just the way one usually thinks about work, but there have been many efforts recently to turn work into something more exciting, more interesting, more plausible than work had been before. And that is one of the things that stimulated me into writing a book called New Work, New Culture. 
So would it be fair to say that the goal of the new work movement is to try to get meaningful and fulfilling jobs for everybody? Yes, that's putting it rather mildly. <laughs> the idea is, has been from the very beginning that new work possibly would be a new movement and it would be a new movement sort of in many countries and I've traveled in many countries including Russia and India and so forth and in all of these countries I have tried to sow the seeds of new work and I don't mean to brag but I have failed in any number of ways but I've not failed in this uh, it has turned out that work is an, has become an extremely important and central subject in many different countries, and that many different countries investigate how work could be different from how it has been in the past. I think this is something that's really striking about your research, which is that you don't just sort of sit around in the armchair and idly speculate about how society could be set up or what work could be, you've actually sort of done a lot of trial and error in practice in some of these different countries that you've talked about. So what would be an example of a new work program that you did in Russia or India or one of these other places? Like, how did it work and what was the goal? Well, I've done projects in many different countries. I didn't mention Austria as where I grew up in the city of Steyr, which is a famous, famous city for manufacturing. New work was taken up, and one of the very first major projects were electric motorcycles that we manufactured in Steyr. And that created a great deal of excitement, because at the point at which we were doing this, and that's now over 10 years ago, electric motorcycles were unheard of, but now they have become very common. So I would say the idea of altering work into something far more satisfying, far more interesting, far more intriguing than work had been in the past, that idea has, for better or worse, caught old and now is discussed. For example, I was very interested when I went to India that I thought that surely in India new work would not fly at all because of Gandhi and all the things he stood for. But that was one of the things I was very wrong about. Actually, in India, people were extremely interested in technologies and the sort of technologies we were talking about and that became one of the things that happened in India, that the technologies of work were eagerly sought and eagerly discussed. They were much more, much more receptive than I had ever thought, because I had thought that in India this would just be a non-starter, but it wasn't. And similarly in Russia, I went to Russia with misgivings with a feeling that maybe nothing exciting would happen in Russia, given all sorts of things that we all know. But it was wrong that actually the people in Russia that I met treated me with extraordinary politeness and handed me around and I lectured in Moscow and I lectured in all kinds of places. And wherever I went, people made it obvious that they were interested in forms of work different from those that they already had, that they were moving in the direction of new work very much as we are in Germany and in Austria and in the United States. So I was very surprised at the reception in India and I was very surprised at the reception in Russia. So one thing that's interesting about this is that I think normally when we think about Technology, maybe to take your motorcycle example, normally we think about what does it take to build a motorcycle. Well, we think about a big factory. We think about, like, you know, the thing that was caricatured in Charlie Chaplin's film, Modern Times, where every, masses of people are doing, like, boring and repetitive work, that one person is doing the same thing all day. 
and uh, you know this is the standard process by which we make something like a motorcycle. But what are some differences between the, like the actual manufacturing process that you did versus the traditional one that we kind of have in the back of our minds? Thank you for asking me that question, and, and I would say there is a key difference which has to be mentioned fairly at the beginning of this conversation, namely new work as opposed to other forms of work or other things that one discusses under the heading of working. New work is an effort to create a different approach to work. And central to that different approach is the idea of making it possible for people to do work that they really, really want. And that has become a phrase that has sort of taken wings that lots of people now talk about in many different countries now talk about work as something that one really, really wants. And I sometimes get invited to conferences where sort of the whole subject of work is painted on a large screen. And what happens is that again and again and again people emphasize that there has been a shift, there has been a movement. There is something in, in the works that one hadn't anticipated, and that is that now, in many countries, people want work that they really, really want, and making it possible for people to have work that they really, really want has become sort of one of the flags under which new work flies. Hmm. So maybe one difference, then, between the traditional assembly line way of building some piece of technology like a motorcycle might be, well, maybe we're only going to build this thing if this is the thing we've decided we want. So it's not like, hey, I and friends in the community are out of work and we'll just take any job because we need a job. Rather, you know, you show up somewhere and you ask somebody, hey, what do you need? And let's work together to help you build whatever you want to build, not just like you need any old job at all. So like, you know, the worker getting to choose what they're working on maybe is part of the difference. That is part of has changed that people are much more ready to say, I want to have some say in the work I do, and it has to be work that I want to do. And that shift away from doing work because one is told to do it, or because one is coerced to do it, or one is forced to do it, shifting away from that into a mode of where work has become something that people want to have a say in. They want to say what kind of work they want to do. And I would say, and I hope that doesn't sound bombastic, that that is a change that is virtually worldwide. That now people in all kinds of countries make different demands on work as opposed to what it was 20 years ago or 10 years ago. Yeah. So it's like you're kind of reconnecting the desire to accomplish the goal back up with the person who's actually accomplishing the goal. Whereas if those are two different people, if I'm just doing this for somebody else, like it just sort of feels weird. Like, why am I even doing this? Whereas if I'm doing it because it's a goal that I set for myself, then the work becomes more meaningful. Yes, that's essentially correct and is one of the things that has made new work a plausible title. I mean, people don't constantly ask me, what do you mean new work? On the contrary, it's very common to think of work as something that is now being reinvented and that is now new from what it was formerly and people want to find out what this new work is about. And so the interest in new work is extremely great and that has excited me greatly to participate in this movement towards work that is being done by people who want to do work that they want. So in your book, New Work, New Culture, you talk about new work not only as a alternative, but also a reversal to the job system, which is what we have right now. So I'm interested in hearing more about what exactly is the job system. Is it just the fact that people are paid to do their work, or is there something more to it? Oh, there's much more to it. But to my mind, if I may be somewhat braggadocious, the idea of doing work that people really want was a new idea. It was not something that 20 years ago 
uh, sort of took for granted and they allowed it to pass. On the contrary, that work could be something that people decide on, that they have an intention attached to it, that work was something they cared about, or they wouldn't do it. They would only do it if it had meaning. I have come to address so many different conferences, and I don't know how many different countries, but in all kinds of different countries, that has become the key word. The key word has become, in, whether it's India or Russia, the United States, in all of these respects, is somewhat behind other countries. But the idea of making it possible for people to work in ways that they find not just sort of all right, but that they find sensuous and exciting and the best part of their life, that the idea that work is the best part of life, that good work is, so to say, more exciting than sex, that idea has become common. And it's been something of a surprise to me that work should go through this transformation of being exciting and sensuous and intriguing and meaningful. And it's not the same words over and over and over again, but it's very much new words, new ideas, new approaches, new expectations. There's something very different about how work is now organized and structured and wanted from how it was 20 years ago. To get back to the question of what is the essence of the job system, Fritz Hoff and I were talking about it this morning, and I think my objection to the job system isn't so much that people work for money as it is that people work for other people in a relationship which is somewhat coercive because if you find yourself getting up in the morning probably to an alarm being shocked into wakefulness so you can make your deadline of getting to a certain place on time to do some work and you find yourself just not wanting to do it you're dozy, you're, you're woozy from sleep that was inadequate to begin with. You were forced to awake. You find yourself looking forward, dreading the day actually. You dread the day that you're going to have to go through. And then you think about doing something else and not going to work. And then you think about the people who are dependent upon you, your spouse and your children. And you end up saying, okay, time to get up and get around and you shower as quickly as you can and eat an inadequate breakfast in a rush and kiss your spouse goodbye and you head off to work in a car that probably is you don't know how you're going to pay for it because you know that if you don't go to work two Fridays from now you won't be able to make the ritual trip to the grocery store for the supplies that you need for the next week and to pay the other bills around town for things you need. In this kind of situation, the person you're working for has control over you, which is, to my own mind, it's not dignified human life. And the job system has large numbers of people trapped in this mode of life, and there's got to be something better there was something better 300 years ago and why can't there be something better 20 years from now? No, that hits the nail on the head. That is, work in the past was something to which people didn't have the feeling there was an alternative. They were controlled. They were coerced. They needed, they must do this just as David describes it, the alarm clock rings and they have to get up, like it or not. And that is very much the rhythm, that is very much the organization around which the work revolved. I would argue that that has fundamentally changed. Work now is different from what it was 20 years ago. And we are at the cutting edge of making that obvious and known, and now it is the subject that lots of people want to hear about and think about and talk about. And that's, of course, an enormous 
confirmation of what has happened. So when I think of a job that doesn't fit this mold you've been talking about, where your alarm wakes you up and you like roll your eyes and you're like, oh man, another day at work. Ugh. The first things I think about as like the opposite of that would be either creative professions. That's the way people talk about them. So like being a comedian or being a filmmaker or maybe being a fine artist, you know, who's able to have a career in the art world. That's one type of job where people who at least are successful don't talk about it that way. They talk about it as something they really want to do. And then another example that jumps to mind is in certain maybe small companies, like uh, successful startups in their early days, people also often talk about it. Yeah, this is a passion project. That's why I'm not even getting paid for the first few months. It's something I'm really excited about what the company's doing. Um, those are sort of two examples that jump to mind where at least people talk about it as being a bit different from the like, oh, no, the alarm clock went off. I have to go into work again type of job. So would those be examples of new work, or are those still not quite all the way there yet? I'm glad you asked that question, because I think it is central that we answer that question and address it and not avoid it. That is, it's not quite new work. The essence of new work is that somebody does work that he or she really, really wants. And we have made a habit of repeating the word really, and saying it has to be really, really what you want. Otherwise, it isn't new work. It's still the old work. And we are trying to make something happen that is different from that. And the idea of working at something that I seriously, intensely, passionately, really, really want has proved itself to have enormous power that people really re flock to that idea and want something like that. And that was not the case 10 years ago. Hmm. So what's missing from the case of, for example, like a really successful comedian who gets to put all their creative energy into coming up with new material and is able to have a career performing live and, you know, and so on and so forth? What is missing is quite possibly the answer is nothing. Mm -hmm. that he's mm -hmm. doing fine. He, what he does could be new work. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. And it could be very satisfying. And not just satisfying, but could be what he really, really wants. And nothing less than that. And that is maybe one way of capturing the greatness of the shift that has happened. That work used to be something for which I coined the phrase a mild disease. It was not cancer, but it was a mild disease in the sense that it was really not what one wanted. It was a drag. It was something one suffered, one put up with. That's the quintessence of what work was, but that's no longer the essence of what work now is. For many people now, work is something that they had time to think about, and they decided that maybe... Becoming a comedian would be a way of being passionate about one's work. And uh, I have met some comedians that did feel passionately about their work as comedians, and that's new work. So is there a problem of the poverty of desire, as you put it, that a lot of people are struggling to find out what they exactly want out of their life? Yeah. My own feeling is that yes, of course, that is one of the key problems, that people don't, you know, I mean, I run constantly into people, all the way back in Flint, I ran into people who said, nobody ever asked me that question. Nobody said to me, think of something that you really want to do, and do something you really want. That was the opposite of what people expected me to do. They expected me to fit in, to stay within the prefabricated notions of what work should be. I feel like know your place is something people used to say a lot. Yeah. That's my impression, right? When somebody would ask that question. And, and that now has fundamentally changed. Not completely. It's still a process. But it is a process that is underway where people approach work with entirely different expectations wants, desires, 
And of course, the way we talk about work as something that you might find exciting and wonderful, many people have trouble with that and say, I don't know what there is. Maybe other people have something that is as exciting as the, uh, but I don't. But it turns out that that is temporary, that very many people, uh, not at the beginning, but somewhere down the road, have decided they understand what is meant by new work or work that they really want, and they do that as opposed to merely suffer it. Yeah, this is something I've never heard anybody talk about before, but I think you're absolutely right. For a lot of people, the question, what do you really want to do, is like impossible to answer at first. They have to like almost like do these like mental calisthenic exercises to get yeah. themselves into the frame of mind where they can even come up with what do I want to do really. Right. I mean, it's a fact that many people that are sort of in the transition to adulthood Many people, their experience is that they have been told again and again from different sources, whether it is the pastor or the parent or the teacher, but they have been told not to make demands, but to adjust themselves to what is expected. That creates part of the difficulty you raised, that for many people, the idea that work could be something that they passionately want to do is a new idea, and it's a stumbling block, and they don't know what to do with it. Um, our entire society has institutions, entire huge institutions, education and religion come to mind, but they're all set up, and parenting in many families is centered around compliance and survival, and you don't do what you want. You do what you have to do to get past the policeman, to get past the teacher, to get past the school, to get past into an employment relationship without challenging or doubting or questioning whether or not these things should be challenged and questioned. And as a result, there's large numbers of people that one person cynically and cruelly referred to this group of people as a, a basket of deplorables. They think that it's wrong to have aspirations and they're very resentful of being in this situation and they become in many ways asocial or antisocial and it ends up being a serious problem for society but also a serious problem for them and when you try and give them permission to want something it's a, it, maybe that is a point excuse me for jumping in but maybe that is a point that should be emphasized that very many people grow up with parents or with teachers or with pastors or with whatever who try to tell them that wanting things is a bad thing that one shouldn't want things. And that is still quite common, although it is on its way out. And it was worse, but now it is abating. And people now have more the feeling that maybe it is okay to want something intensely. But that's relatively new. That's not what was the case 20 years ago. So what could be done such that people have an easier time finding out what they really oh, want. what can be done? Plenty. In my experience, and I have many years of experience with this, people say, nobody ever has asked me what I really, really want. That was a completely new, especially, let's say, with the car workers in Flint. Car workers didn't expect to be asked what they really want. In fact, that was precisely the opposite of what they had experienced. Their experience was, you don't ask for things, you accept things, you fit in, you make do with what you get. In contrast to that, we started to encourage people to ask themselves, what is it that I really seriously want? But for many people, this is absolutely new. I can say I have met more people 
that I can think of who have uh, felt that that was an illegitimate question. It just wasn't what one should do. One shouldn't ask for something like that. It's more than one should do. I feel like often it's framed as being like irresponsible. Like the adult thing to do is just suck it up and do what you have to rather than think about what you want to do. At least that's the way people talk about it. Yeah. Right. Very much so. Yeah. I would just say in addition to this that not only is it a psychological injury, it's a moral injury when you're when you're kept from because I believe that people in their essence are decent people, they want to do the right thing. And when you are kept from realizing what the right thing is, you're less likely to do it and, and to achieve that moral goal. So let's say I've had a sort of awakening and I realize, you know, I don't find my job every day really that fulfilling. And I'm finally asking for the first time, what do I really want to do? And let's say I even find an answer. I really want to do X. What do I do then? How can I get a job doing this thing I've decided that I want to do? It's not like I can like pay myself a salary, uh, you know. Um, like so, how can I get paid to do this thing that I really want to do without it turning into the kind of coercive relationship to an employer that David was talking about earlier? We want to avoid that situation, but how can I make it happen? Fritjof and I were talking this morning, and one of the things I said was that we need to have a basic and what we call a social safety net. But a person should be able to know that he doesn't have to give in to the coercion in order for his children to eat. A person should know that he doesn't have to give in to the coercion in order to have a place where his children will be safe at night and be able to sleep in, in relative comfort. He shouldn't have to be given having to give in to a system of coercion in order to have um, medical care for his children that will assure their good health for their lives. It doesn't have to be anything fancy, but it's got to be adequate. And then he should also know that his children will be educated, not only so that they're able to be productive, but also so they can contribute to the democracy that they're expected to participate in. Give them these four things without coercion. Do that and then all of a sudden deciding to quit the job and going after what you really, really want is not so foreboding. It's not such a, a terrible obstacle to overcome. But as long as you're feeling trapped, the idea of quitting your reliable Friday paycheck so you can buy the goods for the next week that you need, as long as there's coercion that you have to do that, any hope for discovering yourself, it's dashed. Let me underline what David just said. I mean, I think for some people, the idea of new work, new culture, is somehow startling. What is possible in the way of a new culture? But it's not. It's exactly what now is happening, that people now, for the first time, maybe in many years, have the feeling that something radically new is possible. They can ask for something that has not been asked for before. And that does represent a new culture, a culture in which people demand things that they did not dare to demand before. And we encourage that, and we foster that, and we build things around that. And I think that ultimately means that without using words like revolutionary, we actually are at the cutting edge of a revolutionary movement. Yes. We live in revolutionary times, that's for sure. So one question that I have about that is, so following David's point, a certain baseline of economic stability, it would seem, is required for a person to be able to have the freedom to ask this question and then to go out and try to get the work they really want. But one striking thing about the work that you've done in this area is that you've gone to various nations in the global south where people don't generally have that level of economic stability 
and you still made new work happen in those places. So how did you do it? It fell into my lap. <laughs> I, I, I didn't do it, but the thing was much more that, uh, to my surprise, I was asked to go to Russia. I never thought of Russia as a place where I would have anything to say that would be of use to people. But it turned out that actually, precisely in Russia, people said, no, what you're trying to do in the United States is what we are trying to do in Russia. In Russia, we want more of an idea of people desiring and insisting and making something happen. That was to me a big surprise that people in Russia felt that that was what they wanted to do next. But that is the answer to your question. I didn't do it. I didn't preach particularly. They said, you are doing something that we care about, and we want you to make it clearer to us what it is. And so explain it, do it. And so I was asked from one place to another place to another place to explain these things. And that is what people felt was okay. So when we're thinking about alternatives to a capitalistic job system, we usually think about socialism. How would you compare the New Work movement to socialism, be it a Marxist or unionist or otherwise? Well, Fritjof and I were discussing that this morning at Matt's prompting. And for the first time this morning, Fritjof gave me the, the clear realization that socialism concentrates on making for a better society. New work, on the other hand, tends to concentrate on the individual and making the individual better. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the two conflict because, in fact, in order to have a better society, you're going to have a better society if you have better people. More productive, more moral. There's, I don't see any any insurmountable barrier between being a socialist and seeking to live new work. The two can go hand in hand, but certainly they are distinct things in their ultimate goal. Yeah, very good. Yeah, and I think this is a, one of many examples in your work of where you have certain commonalities with stereotypically left-wing political views and also certain commonalities with stereotypically right-wing political views. In everyday conversation, we typically assume that being critical of the job system goes along with not focusing on the individual, instead focusing on structural societal patterns. So it seems like you're opening up kind of a new position in logical space here, where we can critique the job system, but also critique it from the individual's point of view. Very true. That is actually, as far as I can tell, many people who claim that they have revolutionary ideas really don't think in terms of changing the job system. And changing the job system is the most obvious revolutionary thing you can do. But it is not constantly in the discussion. What's in the discussion is much more other things that people can change but not the job system. Fritjof Bergman and David Helmbold, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much for the conversation we had. For coming here. <laughs> Our pleasure. Hope to have you back. The Elucidations blog has moved. We are now located at elucidations.now.sh. On the blog, you can find our full back catalog of previous episodes. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out on Twitter at, at ElucidationsPod. Thanks again for listening.